If there was a team that could best be described as a roller coaster with high peaks and low valleys, it would be the team from Washington, D.C. The team known throughout the majority of its history as the Washington Redskins saw its fair share of incredible success and also great controversy. On today's episode of Football Ancestry, we unpack the franchise's entire history and what led us to this new name and where they are today. In 1932, the city of Boston was granted an NFL team, which was founded by the team owner George Preston Marshall. Marshall named the team the Braves after the Major League Baseball team, the Boston Braves, with whom they shared a stadium with. In their inaugural season, the Boston Braves went 4-4-2, not bad for the team's first year of existence, although this would end up being their first and only year as the Boston Braves. Following the 1932 season, the team moved to Fenway Park, shared with the Major League Baseball team, the Boston Red Sox. George Preston Marshall would rename the team the Boston Redskins. The Boston Redskins would continue to be a middle-of-the-road team, going 5-5-2 and 6-6 and in their first two seasons. Following a 2-8-1 campaign, the Boston Redskins would actually go 7-5 in 1936 and earn a spot in the NFL Championship game. They would end up losing that game to the Green Bay Packers 21-6. And despite this recent rebound and trip to the championship game, George Preston Marshall decided to relocate the franchise, citing a lack of support by fans in the Boston area as his reason for moving. In 1937, the team moved to the Washington, D.C. area and renamed the Washington Redskins, a name they would hold for the next 81 years. And they started right where they left off as the Boston Redskins, going 8-3 in their inaugural season in Washington and actually winning the championship 28-21 over the Chicago Bears. And for the next nearly 10 years, the team would carry on that success, not having a losing record through 1945 and in that eight-year span, reaching the NFL championship four times, winning it all in the 1942 season, in which they finished with an impressive 10-1 season. The first decade of team dominance quickly grew the devotion of Washington locals, but this early success wasn't without its blemishes. The biggest blemish of them all, the 1940 NFL championship game, a rematch with the Bears who they had beaten three years prior. This time, however, the Bears would beat the Washington Redskins, 73-0. Yes, you heard that right, 73-0. I'll go on record and make the not-so-bold claim that this might be the most embarrassing loss in NFL history. However, the past eight years of winning could help mediate that sting of the loss. The next quarter of a century, on the other hand, would test the patience of the fan base. Between 1946 and 1970 saw a period of decline and controversy. The Redskins would not reach the playoffs again until 1971, with only four winning seasons during that stretch of 25 years, only winning 38% of their games. Trying to drum up excitement about his team during that stretch, Owner George Preston Marshall would team up with the American Oil Company to help televise all Redskins games, making them the first NFL team to have an entire season worth of televised games. Marshall would also hire former Packers legend Curly Lambeau to be his head coach. However, this only lasted two seasons. Marshall also moved the Redskins into their own brand new stadium, DC Stadium, later renamed Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Stadium or RFK Stadium. However, these stunts were overshadowed by a much bigger controversy. During this time period under George Preston Marshall, the Redskins were the only remaining NFL team to not integrate both white and black players. Marshall would begin to feel pressure from the federal government, with the Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall, of the Kennedy administration, threatening to prevent the Redskins from playing at their new stadium if they did not integrate. 
and the federal government had the right to do this as the new DC stadium was federally owned. This was the first time in history the federal government had attempted to desegregate a professional sports team. And the pressure worked, and the Redskins finally integrated when they chose running back Ernie Davis with the first overall pick in the 1962 draft, the first time an African American player was selected with the first pick in the draft. Davis had no interest in playing for the blatantly racist George Preston Marshall, and demanded a trade almost immediately. He would be dealt to the Cleveland Browns under coach Paul Brown. Unfortunately, Davis would be diagnosed with leukemia that same year, and passed away at the young age of 23, without ever playing in an NFL game. Around 1962, George Preston Marshall began to show signs of mental decline, and the team began to transition to majority stockholder Jack Kent Cook. Cook lived all the way on the West Coast and actually owned the NBA team, the Los Angeles Lakers, and therefore Cook had little interest in the Redskins. Minority stockholder Edward Bennett Williams from the DC area was selected to run the team's operations. He made two splash moves as de facto owner of the Redskins, including the hiring of former quarterback legend Otto Graham to be the head coach, though Graham would fizzle out after just three seasons. But his next hire would repeat history, as he signed a former Green Bay Packers legend, this time Vince Lombardi, in 1969. Lombardi would lead the Redskins to their first winning season since 1955. However, he would unfortunately pass away from complications with cancer after only one season in Washington. Following the passing of Lombardi and the unsuccessful 1970 season under interim coach Bill Austin, Edwards Williams would make one of the best decisions in Redskins history so far, the signing of head coach George Allen. In his first season in 1971, the Redskins would return to the playoffs after a 26-year drought. Allen's team would become known as the Over the Hill Gang, as Allen preferred veterans to younger players. That season would earn him Coach of the Year honors. The next year, the Redskins would earn home field advantage in the playoffs and advance to the NFC Championship game, in a game against divisional rival Dallas Cowboys. The Redskins would deliver a 26-3 romping of the Cowboys, much to the delight of their fan base. However, Don Shula's undefeated Dolphins would defeat the Redskins 14-7 in Super Bowl VII. George Allen's Redskins would return to the playoffs three more times in 1973, 74, and 76. However, they would be one and done in all of those appearances. Following a playoffless 9-5 campaign in 1977, Allen was let go from his position in Washington. Jack Party would be named the new head coach of the Redskins, and majority stockholder Jack Kent Cook would become reinterested in the team with all of its recent success, and he would move back to the Virginia area where he would take back control of the daily operation of the team from Edward Williams. Following three decent seasons under Jack Party, owner Jack Kent Cook would make the best decision of Redskins history, the signing of head coach Joe Gibbs in 1981. In his first season, Gibbs finished 8-8 eight eight after the team had started 0-5 that year. The following year in 1982 was shortened by a player's strike, but Gibbs' team would still finish the regular season with an 8-1 record. The Redskins would go on to defeat the Vikings in the divisional round of the 1982 playoffs, and the fans were absolutely going crazy. <laughs> Reportedly chanting, We Want Dallas, referring to the upcoming opponent in the championship round. And so much so, that they were physically shaking the entire stadium. They would go on to crush the Cowboys 31-17 in the NFC Championship. The Redskins would advance to Super Bowl 17, where they would face a rematch against the same team they faced a decade ago, the Miami Dolphins. This time, however, the Redskins would win 27-17 after a go-ahead touchdown late in the game on a 43-yard run up the middle on 4th and inches by running back John Riggins. This would be the Redskins' first Super Bowl victory and first NFL championship win since 1942. And maybe even more impressive than the Super Bowl is that Redskins place kicker Mark Mosley 
was awarded the NFL MVP for the 1982 season, the first and only time a kicker has won that award. Gibbs also won his first of back-to-back -back NFL Head Coach of the Year awards. Gibbs would follow up 1982 with a 14-2 season in 1983, where his team would go again to the Super Bowl, the second time in his first three seasons coaching the team, on the back of a dominant offense led by quarterback Joe Theismann. However, they would lose Super Bowl 18 to the Raiders 38-9. In Gibbs's 12 seasons in Washington, he would finish with double-digit wins eight times, two of those being 14-2 finishes. He would make four Super Bowl appearances, winning three of them, those being the previously mentioned 82 season, as well as in 87 and 91. The 87 season was particularly special as it came during a player's strike-shortened season. The Redskins were the only team to have no players cross the picket line, meaning they played three games that season with a complete team of random replacements. Gibbs led that team to victory in all three of those games and guaranteeing their path to the Super Bowl. And that's not to discount the 1991 team either, which some consider as one of the best teams of all time that featured both a dominant offense and defense, and in particular, offensive line. Their offensive line, nicknamed the Hogs, gave up only 9 sacks all season, the third best mark in the entire NFL history. Either way, following a 9-7 season in the 1992 season that saw the team exit the playoffs in the divisional round, Joe Gibbs would retire from the NFL as one of the best to ever do it. The Washington Redskins had returned to the top of the mountain from the depths of the previous decades of losing and embarrassment of the integration controversy, off the back of George Allen and the legendary Joe Gibbs. However, the years following Gibbs would immediately dip back to new lows, the team going 4-12 in 1993, their first season without Gibbs. The team would even out to about a middle-of-the-road team under new head coach Norv Turner. And in one of his last moves, owner Jack Cook approved the construction of a new stadium to replace the beloved RFK Stadium, which had served the team since 1961. In 1997, owner Jack Kent Cook would pass away at age 84. In his will, Cook left the team to his foundation, with the instructions to sell the team. His son, John Cook, announced that the new stadium his dad had approved would be named Jack Kent Cook Stadium in his honor. After two seasons in control, John Cook was unable to raise the necessary funds to purchase the Washington Redskins for himself, and in 1999, instead sold the team for $800 million, the most expensive team purchase in sporting history at the time to billionaire businessman Daniel Snyder. Just months after taking control of the team, Daniel Snyder would sell the naming rights to the brand new Jack Kent Cook Stadium and have it renamed to FedEx Field, a move that would really set the tone for his tenure of ownership, one of disappointment and general dislike. The Snyder era has actually seen some good head coaching and player talent walk through the doors. But at the end of the day, losing is the one constant of his ownership. Coaches such as Marty Schottenheimer, the return of Joe Gibbs out of retirement, and Mike Shanahan. Players include the fan favorite and hard-hitting safety Sean Taylor, who was tragically shot and killed in his home in 2007. The NFL would honor Taylor with a number 21 decal on all the helmets around the league, and a moment of silence before each game the week of his passing. Taylor was voted posthumously to the Pro Bowl and second team All-Pro. The Redskins had thought they had found their next generational franchise quarterback with the selection of Robert Griffin III in the 2012 draft. RG3 put up impressive numbers and won the Offensive Rookie of the Year, on his way to leading the Redskins to their first divisional title since 1999. However, that season ended with controversy, as RG3 had injured his knee in Week 14, but the Redskins reportedly cleared RG3 to play in their wildcard game despite not getting approval from his doctor. 
RG3 would return to the playoffs, but would end up re-injuring his knee and tearing his LCL and ACL in their loss. The team would absolutely crumble in 2013 and go 3-13 as RG3 did not return to the promising form he had showed in his rookie year, and the rest of the team around him failed. The remainder of the 2010s saw mediocre football led by head coach Jay Gruden. However, the low level of play on the field would not be the lowest point of the Snyder era. In 2019 and 2020, the team organization went under investigation for several incidents of sexual harassment, bullying, and intimidation under Snyder's rule. The NFL would fine the Redskins $10 million, and although this would be certainly the lowest point, it wouldn't be the only major shakeup coming to Daniel Snyder's Washington Redskins. In 2020, the team announced it would finally be moving on from its controversial team name and logo due to strong public pressure from shareholders urging sponsors to cut ties with the team until the name was changed, and several retailers pulling Redskins merchandise from store shelves. Ultimately, the team decided to retire the name it had held since 1937, in July of 2020. In the meantime, the team would be called the Washington Football Team as the team worked on finding a new mascot and logo. New head coach Ron Rivera was also brought in to help establish a new team culture within the building. He would make the playoffs at 7-9 his first season with the team and finish 7-10 his second season. Rivera began the process of establishing a strong defensive line, anchored by Chase Young, Jonathan Allen, and Deron Payne. And exciting receiver Terry McLaurin looked to spark the offensive side of the ball for the next era of Washington football. And while a joke at first, the Washington football team name kind of grew on a portion of the fan base over its two seasons. But in the end, a new mascot was named in February of 2022. It was announced that the team would now be called the Washington Commanders. With a nucleus beginning to form on both offense and defense, there is hope this new era of football in Washington will be a return to the top of the roller coaster. Their all-time record sits at 617 wins, 622 losses, and 28 ties, a 49% win rate. They also have five NFL championships in their history, with three Super Bowl victories in five appearances, tied for the seventh most all-time. Overall, a franchise with great heights and also great lows, marked by championship dynasties and troubling controversy. But with a new page turning, there is hope for new and greater beginnings. Thank you all so much for watching this far into the video. It was a long one, but I hope you enjoyed learning a little NFL history. I'd invite you to please subscribe if you'd like to stay notified of future content like this one. And please like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.